Um, I'm Graham Newbig. Nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm an associate professor at uh, the Carnegie Mellon University Language Technologies Institute. Um, Bob Frederick here is the uh, is the co lecturer. Um, we have a bunch of good TAs. I'm going to introduce everybody at the end um, so they can have a little bit of time to talk about their research and you know their interests. Um, and part of the reason why is because. Um, you know, this is a class mainly oriented towards uh, allowing people to be able to do, uh, you know, good research in uh, the NLP area. Um, and because of this, you know, knowing the research areas of the TAs and who to talk to and stuff like this can be useful. Um, even if we don't cover all of NLP, we cover a good chunk of it. So we should have uh, people you can talk to regardless of what your interests are in. Um, okay. So I will get started. So this is an obligatory slide. I don't really know if I need to say this for anybody who enrolled for the class, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the basic idea is um, NLP is technology to handle human language. And usually we're referring to text uh, using computers. And this is very vague. Um, but it allows us to do a lot of different things. So um, one of the things that it can allow us to do is aid human-human communication. So we have two humans communicating in some way. Uh, machine translation is a stereotypical example of that, where you know one person speaks one language, one person speaks another language, and uh, we translate between them so they can speak with each other. There's also other things that you could do, like you could have um, dialogue assistants, uh, automatic meeting mod moderators, you know, uh, any number of things like that. Another thing is aiding human machine communication. So human machine communication uh, could be through question answering or dialogue systems. Uh, you interact with these systems uh, probably a lot when you do web search or other things like that. Another thing is analyzing or understanding language. So this is uh, doing things like syntactic analysis, text classification, um, entity or relation uh, recognition and linking. And these kind of things uh, turn unstructured language into structured uh, representations uh, for use in a number of downstream tasks. Uh, these text analysis things usually aren't the final thing that you want to do. Usually it's to turn it into a uh, machine readable format that makes it easier to use for other things that you would like to do downstream. So now um, in our daily life, we use NLP systems many, many times a day. Uh, if you use a search engine, for example, um, I talk to my uh, you know, home assistant uh, to ask it the weather and just about nothing else um, uh, every day. Uh, sometimes I ask it to play music for me. Um, those are kind of like the two most common queries that uh, people use these things for, but um, it can also do uh, relatively complicated things like question answering and things like this. And um, I use machine translation some of the time. It's really amazing over the past several years what we're able to do now. And I'd just like to give a few examples. So NLP can answer questions. I will type something like this into a search box, you know, Google or any other one. Uh, the question, where was the first movie theater in the US? And it gives you an answer. It says Pittsburgh, um, which is right. Uh, so if you want to go see it, you can go downtown. Um, another thing it can do is translation. And when I try to do examples of using an NLP system in action, I try to, like translation system in action, I try to grab the first article of the front page news and copy in the first sentence or like the first or second paragraph or something like that, um, because this shows like the actual, you know, how good an NLP system is in action. So this is not cherry picked. It's just the first sentence on that day. And it says, um, it, it's originally in Japanese and it says in Osaka prefecture, which is shifted from a state of emergency priority measures such as prevention of spread, uh, the provision of alcoholic beverages at restaurants has been partially lifted. Um, however, it is essential to apply for a gold sticker certified by the prefecture to provide it. 
Um, it is necessary to clear 43 items of infection control and the application and restaurants are screaming that the hurdle is too high. There are more than 40 items, too many, and it is uh, difficult to complete the procedure online. It's really complicated. That's good. And that's like way better than it would have been five years ago. Um, so this is a huge amount of progress. Um, so that's exciting. I know Japanese, so I know, uh, yes, I know that it's right also. So it's not just <laughs> random. Uh, I, see, I see the number 43. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's basically, it, it's basically perfect. And it's like a very nice uh, idiomatic translation. Um, there's also all kinds of other things that you might not think of very frequently that are nonetheless really good um, applications of NLP that allow you to do exciting things that we haven't been able to do before. So just to give one example of this, let's say we have a research question um, in the field of computational social science, where we'd like to know something about society and answer a question, uh, answer research questions. Um, so for example, uh, this is just one example. There's many, many examples of this, of course, but um, do movie scripts and modern movies portray female or male characters with more power or agency? So are they treating their characters as, you know, like equally, um, equally powerful or equally able to do their, uh, their own things? And so uh, one way to do this in this paper that I cited here is that they do dependency parsing which basically is, we'll talk more about it later, but it's basically uh, analyzing, the, um, analyzing the relationships between words in the sentence. And they look at the subject and the object, and then they have a list of verbs that indicate increased power, decreased power, increased agency, decreased agency. And then they can run this analysis over a big thing of uh, movie scripts and get a result showing that portrayals of male characters uh, with more agency or more power are more common, and portrayals of female characters with less agency or less power are less common. So it's not a happy thing, it's not a happy result, but it's a result that reflects our society and allows us to say interesting, answer interesting things. And the only reason why we can do this is because we have a fundamental NLP technology of dependency parsing working in a way that allows us to do this. So I wanted to give these three examples because these three examples go back to the three major categories that I said here, human-human communication, human-machine communication, analyzing and understanding language. So pretty cool, huh? OK. However, it doesn't work all the time. And so we have um, this example, who won the 2021 Pittsburgh mayor Democratic primary? and. This is a question that I could tell you the answer to. I think a lot of people in Pittsburgh could tell you the answer to it. It's Ed Ganey. Um, and in fact, on the very first page of this 2021 Pittsburgh mayor election, it says the primary election was held on May 18, 2021. Incumbent Democratic mayor Bill Peduto ran for re-election but lost renomination to state representative Ed Ganey. So this information is obviously there. Um, but somehow, you know, the system was not able to pick this up. So it's a failure of, uh, you know, um, it's a failure of the model to have sufficient coverage. This is in English over Wikipedia. So these are the, like, the easiest things, the things where NLP is basically designed to do well on this domain, yet it's still failing here. Here's another example. Who invented neural machine translation? And I get a very nice French translation of who invented neural machine. So why did this fail? Any ideas? Right, exactly. And if I put this in more technical terminology, um, there is intent analysis in di dialogue systems where they try to, um, you know, a lot of systems like, uh, like Google search, for example, have a whole bunch of components and they have different specialized components to do different things. And before they decide which component they want to use, they do a text classification problem where they basically classify the query into which component it should be handled by. So basically this was a failure of their intent classification module 
where the intent classification module said this, I should be doing translation. Um, but instead, that was not the like actual thing that was intended to be done here. So this is a failure of text classification, basically. If you put in other things like who invented phrase-based machine translation, it gives you um, an answer. It tries to answer your question. It gives you the answer Warren Weaver, which is not correct, but you know, it, at least it tried. But some people say that. <laughs> he invented statistical translation, not phrase-based translation. Okay. Oh, right. um, so uh, also, you know, I gave you these beautiful uh, Japanese news translation results. Um, so I tried to do the same thing with Burmese or Myanmar, depending on which one you uh, call it. They're both the same language. And um, I fed this in. This is from the first front page of the Voice of America in Burmese. And uh, compare this to what we had for Japanese. And it's a little bit less satisfying. Uh, <laughs> 37, he said, 38, 84 main road of Mandalay. I'm still collecting. I don't know where they got the information in advance. It arrived immediately and was violently suppressed. We do not know exactly. He said four people were involved. He also said that six people were involved. <laughs> it is unknown at this time what he will do after leaving the post, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know Burmese, um, but I'm pretty sure this is not correct. Um, so basically what you can see here is that for, and this is also news. News should be the easier, like one of the easier varieties of translation you could be doing. And um, so we could see that uh, things work quite poorly on low resource languages, for example. I talked about, an yeah. The difference in the quality of translation between Japanese and Japanese is that just because of uh, less resources was that because less research has been conducted on the language? I would say that actually the methodology they're using is pretty similar and they're probably not doing a whole lot of Japanese specific uh, things. We're gonna talk about all reasons why, lots of reasons why Burmese could fail uh, in future classes, but I think it boils down to less data to train the models and also less representation of the models in original data where they did things like make the vocabulary. Um, also Burmese uses a script that no other language uses. So it makes it very hard for it to share information with other languages that the model may have been trained on. So there's lots and lots of reasons why this could be poor. But basically, I think long story short is we're gonna cover those in future classes, but I want to point out that even translation of news is not anywhere close to concern. Yeah. Uh, okay, so really good question. Um, there's actually maybe two parts to the question. I was able to read this and it was coherent and it was not coherent. And because of that, I was able to tell that it was wrong. Um, also, even if it is coherent, is there any way to automatically tell that it's, it's wrong? So um, with respect to how to assign coherence scores, uh, yes, there's definitely ways to do that. Um, maybe one of the easiest ways is to train a very good language model, which we can do on English uh, to uh, assign um, whether something's coherent or not. We'll talk more about that uh, soon. Um, another thing is how can we tell whether it's right or wrong? Um, that There's a field of quality estimation for machine translation, which basically tries to predict whether there are errors in the output or not. And uh, that's an active research field uh, as well. Why does Google not tell you whether it thinks it's right or wrong? That's a good question to ask them. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, maybe they don't want to admit it. You know, maybe um, maybe they've actively made a design decision that they don't want to present that information. Who knows? But, yeah. Another thing to point out is that machine translation is interesting because the evaluation is actually really hard uh, because if you've got two kind of funny translations. How you decide which one's better? Yeah, it's exactly a very hard problem. Yeah, so um, for the people on on Zoom, what Bob said is there's uh, when you assign um, when you do evaluation of machine translation, it's hard because there's different 
uh, bad translations, you could also have different good translations, which makes it quite difficult. And we'll, I think we'll talk about that a bit in, uh, in future classes as well. So let, let's go to something even simpler, identifying the entities in text. Um, so this is something that you might need to do to, for example, analyze characters in movie scripts. If you uh, wanted to identify you know, male characters and female characters for computational social science, you might also need it for uh, analyzing news and finding mentions of uh, entities, trending entities, whatever. Um, so I took the first sentence of the New York Times from August 29th, um, and it said, Hurricane, Hurricane Ida battered Louisiana on Sunday, making landfall as a Category 4 storm, uh, delivering an onslaught of harsh winds, floodwaters, and power outages, and threatening to assail Baton Rouge in New Orleans as one of the most devastating storms to strike the region since Hurricane Katrina. So I recognize them with Stanford Core NLP and Spacey, two widely used English things. Again, this is for English, the easiest language, news, the easiest domain. Um, not easiest language, but most well-resourced language and news, the most well-resourced domain. Um, and neither of them got this sentence completely correct. Um, Core NLP classified Baton Rouge as an organization. And um, Spacey also classified Hurricane Ida as an organization. So um, if anybody tells you NLP is solved, uh, you can tell them uh, to think again. So um, in this class, basically one, what we want to ask is, um, why do these current state-of-the-art NLP systems work uncannily well sometimes? Why can we deliver you know, a near-perfect translation of novel Japanese news? Um, why do current state-of-the-art NLP systems still fail on things that seem like they should be relatively easy? Um, how can we uh, create systems for various tasks, identify their strengths and weaknesses, make appropriate improvements, and achieve whatever we want to do with NLP? And this, um, as I said, this is largely, uh, this class is focused on people who are interested in research or at least research engineering in NLP. So I think one of the focuses of this, especially near the end, is going to be how can we come up with you know, novel methods that solve problems that allow us uh, to do interesting new things that haven't been done before. So that's kind of the intro. Are there any uh, questions or follow-up uh, so far? OK, great. I will move on. Um, so as a general framework to explain NLP systems, this is not, maybe this is too uh, grandiose of a title for what I'm going to say here, but basically uh, we're going to consider um, NLP systems as creating a function to map from an input X, where that input is usually language. It does, it's not necessarily language, but it's usually language uh, to an output Y. And some examples of this, include uh, input X being text, output Y being text in another language, uh, which is translation, uh, input X being text, output Y being a response to that text, which could be uh, dialogue or question answering. Uh, input uh, being text, output Y being a label, text classification, and input text, input being text, output being linguistic structure, which would be language analysis. I realize I didn't put anything that didn't have text on the input, but um, there's also things like data to text generation, where we have like a data record, like a SQL, you know, query or something like that, and we want to output uh, text. Uh, those would also be NLP um, uh, as well, so uh, that would also be very much within the scope. So um, to create such a, a system, we can use a manual creation of rules, or we can use data-driven me methods uh, that learn from uh, paired data machine learning uh, methods. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is um, most of this class is going to be talking about the latter. Um, but if you actually want to build a system that works, you shouldn't be discounting the former. You shouldn't be you know, going to a machine learning system before you're pretty sure that a, a rule-based system is not going to work for the task that you're, uh, you're interested in because you know, uh, 
Oh, well, I, I guess I'll show you a few examples in the next two classes as well. Um, I have one question uh, from Zoom, which is by linguistic structure, do I mean things like part of speech tags or something else? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, linguistic structure can mean a lot of different things. Um, syntactic structure can mean things all the way from part of speech tags to uh, syntactic parse trees uh, being like constituency parse trees that tell you what the phrases in the sentence are to uh, dependency parse trees, which tell you the relationships between the words in the sentence. There's also semantic, uh, like linguistic semantic structure, which could be uh, specifying who did what to whom and some variety of formalism. Uh, we'll be talking about all of those uh, going forward. We have four classes on that, uh, basically. So. Um, could also be talking about discourse structure, which delineates the relationships between sentences. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we're going to do it right now. So um, I'll, I'll show you one example, and then I'll elaborate on some other ones as well. Yeah. So when you say pair data, does that mean that all the machine learning approaches by NPR are supervising this? When I say paired data, um, does that mean all machine learning approaches for NLP are supervised? Uh, absolutely not, no. So may maybe that was an over uh, oversimplification, but you can learn from uh, unpaired data or other varieties of data as well. Yeah. The relation will also also be covered in linguistic structure, right? The, um, what, what would be? Oh, summarization. Um, I don't really consider summarization being linguistic structure. I would say maybe it's more, um, it's closer in nature to the first, to translation, in that you're taking in a text and you're outputting a text. However, there's other ways to summarize things, like you could summarize a big long report into a table or something like that, which would be more a structured approach. So, yeah. Great questions. Okay. So, um, when we create systems, this won't be something super new to uh, people who have done machine learning before, but I feel obliged to uh, mention this just to make sure that nobody's uh, looking at their test data when they're developing systems. So uh, bear with me uh, for a second. So um, when we create a system, we use three sets of data. We have the training set, uh, which is generally a larger data set used during system design, creation, and learning of parameters. Um, we have a development set, which is also called the dev set or the validation set, uh, which we use a smaller data set for testing different design decisions or hyperparameters. And uh, we have a test set, which is a data set reflecting the final testing scenario. Um, we do not use this for making design decisions, and some argue that you shouldn't look at it at all until you have finished designing your method completely and you want to finally test it. Um, there's a famous thing that says you should only run on the test set the day before you write your paper. Um, I don't know if I'm that brave, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that's kind of the ideal. You really don't want to pollute your thinking by you know deciding to improve accuracy on the test set. Um, okay, so one thing that I want to do during this class, which I'm not going to do every class, don't worry but I think it's a really informative exercise is I'd like to work together to try to make a rule-based NLP system. And the reason why I want to do this is because it really forces you to look at and think about the data that you're using. And it makes you realize how hard building NLP systems just by build, uh, creating rules could be. At the same time, there are some tasks where you can definitely do it by creating rules and it'd be very hard to beat it with a machine learning method. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, so what task am I going to try to do this on? We'll try to do it on review sentiment analysis. And I thought of many different tasks that we could try this on. And in the end, this is a very cliche task. It's used for a lot of things, but it's also really easy to understand. So um, I'll, I'll go with this. So given a review on a reviewing website, uh, which is our input X, We'll decide whether it's label Y is positive, uh, negative, or neutral. So in other words, whether the sentence expresses positive sentiment, uh, neutral sentiment, or negative sentiment. Um, here's a quiz. Uh, it might not be hard, but uh, some people might not know the answer. 
What's the difference between sentiment and emotion? Any brave, uh, brave souls? Yes. Uh, sentiment must be expressed for it to be conveyed as a sentiment. Sentiment it must be expressed, expressed in some way for it to be conveyed. For it to be conveyed. Uh, emotion not necessarily. That, that's interesting. I, that's not the answer I was looking for, but I, I wouldn't be, that might be correct also. Yeah. Emotion can be categorical where sentiment can be linear. That's actually a really good point, but that's also not what I was looking for. Um, any other any other ideas? Yeah. Sentiment is most likely thought of as something either positive or negative, whereas emotion is more of a pre-range thing like happy, sad, angry. Yeah, that's um that that's a, a good point. Um there's <laughs> It's a complicated subject. It's a complicated subject. Uh, none of these are the answer that I was looking for, but these are all uh, all good points about sentiment and emotion. I see two people. Um, you can convey a positive sentiment with no emotion. Emotion is a cognitive state. Sentiment is an outward expression. These are uh, these are good things too. Um, my <laughs> so, sorry. My my uh, personal understanding is uh, sentiment is expressed towards an object whereas emotion isn't necessarily. So you can be sad, um, which is you're not sad towards something, uh, but you can have a positive sentiment towards a movie or a negative sentiment towards a movie, but your sentiment needs to be expressed towards something. So um, if I'm wrong, please correct me on the, uh, on the bulletin board or something like that later, but that's my understanding. So um, the, uh, the reason why reviews on reviewing sites are, usually used for sentiment analysis is because reviews are kind of by nature assessing a, an object. And because of that, uh, that would be expressing a sentiment. So um, let's say we have uh, several sentences. We have, I hate this movie. I love this movie. I saw this movie. Um, so this will be the easiest quiz ever, but the first one is which of our three categories? Negative, yes. Positive. Neutral, okay. Um, I'm glad this was easier than the last question. <laughs> so um, let's look at some data for this. And um, I think this is a really good way to start an NLP class because I think you know we should always be looking at our data as much as we can. Um, and so I have the data open here already on my screen, so I can show it to you as well, um, which kind of makes this, um, makes you appreciate uh, kind of the interestingness of this problem, despite the fact that it is a little bit cliched. So the first, uh, the first thing is the rock is destined to be the 21st century's new Conan and he's going to make a splash even greater than Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jean-Claude Van Damme, or Steven Seagal. Um, this is kind of an interesting example. It's the first example in the corpus, but it's also an interesting one in that it doesn't really have any clearly positive sentiment words. Um, maybe greater is kind of positive, destined is kind of positive, but you know, it's not like, I love this movie or something like that. Um, let's go to a neutral one. You'd think by now America would have had enough of plucky British eccentrics with hearts of gold. So this isn't really telling you whether it's positive or negative. It's kind of, you know, it's leading up to something else maybe. And then we go to one of the, the negative ones. This isn't a new idea that's a little bit, maybe a little bit vague, but maybe a little bit negative. Um, a sour little movie at its core, an exploration of the emptiness that underlay the relentless deity of the 1920s. The film's ending has a, what was it all for? Um, I, didn't, I actually wasn't able to tell whether this is like really negative or not, but you know, a sour little movie, I guess is maybe negative. Okay. So we have this data. Um, you can go look through it more. It's on the, um, on the website, which is also linked from the schedule. Um, but 
Yeah, and remember to look at train, um, ideally not dev or test. And um, now given this, uh, I have a kind of code of harness, uh, which gives us uh, a three-step process of making predictions. And um, the first one is feature extraction. Um, extract the salient features for making the decision from text. Um, calculate a score uh, for one or more possibilities and have a decision function that allows you to choose from one of the several possibilities. So this is a common, common thing in the machine learning pipeline in general. Um, I think it's an important way to think of things though. Um, in particular, with respect to feature extraction, um, maybe just to go into this a little bit more deeply, um, a lot of people think of feature extraction as generating features that are useful in making the decision. Um, but I think the salient part is really, really important here. So if anybody's taken an information theory class, you know that you can't add information to something by processing it. So there's no way to like add more information than you had before. Um, any processing will cause you to lose information. But the important thing about feature extraction is that you lose the right information. And so losing the right information, what this means is removing all the information that's not useful for the task that you're planning on doing and keeping all of the information that's useful for the task you're planning on doing. And by doing this, you know, it essentially um, allows you, it makes it easier to learn a scoring function that um, would give you, uh, allow you to make good decisions. Um, so uh, are there any questions about this? This is an important thing, but it's a little bit of an abstract concept. You're, you're removing, the feature extraction is removing the information that's not useful for your downstream task. Okay. Um, we'll see an example in a second. So maybe we can ask more questions then. So um, formally, uh, we can say feature extraction is a little bit like this. We have some function that takes in our input and it converts it into H, um, uh, maybe a vector H. Um, for score calculation, we can also uh, take this vector H and we multiply it by a weight vector or matrix. Um, whether we use a vector or matrix depends on whether we want to do binary classification um, based on a uh, like an axis of scoring where this is positive and this is negative. It actually goes well into the comment we just had before uh, about you know like one axis versus multiple axes. Um, Multi-class uh, classification basically has a bunch of different classes. And you would want to give a score to each of them. So class number one would have a score, two would have a score, three would have a score, four would have a score. Uh, five, sorry, there's five there. Um, and then we have a decision function. Um, a decision function uh, will take in the scores that you have and decide which, uh, which output to give you out. Um, so I will go into uh, some examples uh, and we'll go through this uh, rule-based sentiment classifier here. And um, this is available on the, um, on the code link. Uh, you can go in and download it and play with it yourself. Um, I'm trying to decide, uh, you know, uh, if people would like a challenge, if you can get this rule-based sentiment, uh, rule-based sentiment classifier up to sixty percent without looking at the test set, maybe you uh, you get a point or something like that. We could uh, we could have a challenge like this. Um, so if you want to download it and play with it, uh, that that could be one uh, one motivation to do so. Um, basically, the uh, so I have some ex explanation up here, but I'll also go through it as well. Um, so we have two of the three elements that I talked about up here. We have the extract features function. And what this is doing is this is extracting a Python dictionary 
uh, that has three features right now. One is good word count, one is bad word count, and one is bias. And then we have a, a weight matrix, a weight vector. Um, I to make things easier to understand, I made the weight vector a like named weight vector. So it's basically like um, uh, uh, like good word count, bad word count, and bias. Um, so just to walk through this a little bit, um, X here is a list of words. It's, um, no, sorry, it's a, it's a string, it's a text string. Uh, so we split it up into words. And then we have certain good words and bad words. So things like love and good are good words. Things like hate and bad are bad words. Um, and then we just walk through the input, looking for how many good words we have, looking for how many bad words we have, and count them up. Um, then we have a bias. And what the bias tells us is the bias is always one. So if we multiply in the bias feature, which I set to 0 0.5, um, this will say that if there's no good words in the sentence, no bad words in the sentence, um, it'll get a score of 0 0.5. So um, that's basically what we have here. Um, we can then read in some data. This is just reading in the data that I told you about before. Um, it's reading in the training set. And importantly, it's reading in the dev set. So we're not reading in the test set yet because we're developing our system. Um, and then we can print a few examples. So this is printing the, the first example here uh, that I just showed you before. And it's saying the sentiment label is one. Now, um, this is our run classifier uh, function, and this implements the decision rule. So this basically goes from the score to a categorical label of the text. And um, so we have a thing where we basically step through all of the extracted features, and we multiply the feature value by the feature weight. So if there are five good words, the feature value for good words would be five. Um, and then the, that would be multiplied by 1.0. And if there are three bad words, it would um, be uh, minus one. So this is our calculate accuracy function. Basically, it steps through a data set and calculates our accuracy over the data set. OK, so let's see how well we do. Um, based on the function here, we have 43.3% uh, accuracy on the training set. We have 41.8% accuracy on the dev set. Um, now I'm gonna go a little bit beyond just looking at the accuracy. And what I have here is basically an error analysis. And what it does is it randomly picks five examples that the system got wrong. And so we can look at the five examples that the system got wrong on the training set and um, what this is saying is the true label is minus one. The, uh, the false label is one. Uh, sorry, the, the true label is minus one. The predicted label is one. Um, so we have all, um, like, this is a fudged opportunity. All of the filmmakers calculations can't rescue brown sugar. Uh, get your pooper scoopers. Um, movie strains to stay on the light. I'm excited to issue. The, the. Okay, so maybe we can take five, five to eight minutes to make this better. Um, and uh, we'll have a challenge. Who in the class can increase the accuracy the most um, by telling me something to do here? So this is 43.3. Any ideas? Raise your hand and I'll implement it. Can you give me a good word or a bad word? Yeah. No and not in the bad words. Okay. That's going to be a hard baseline to beat, actually. So, so we go from 43.3 and 41.8 to 44.3. And so uh, congratulations, you already improved the accuracy by one. <laughs> Any other ideas?
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I take the bias and um, so basically what you want to say is take the bias and make it neutral here. Is that um maybe maybe or maybe not. Yeah. Why why don't we change the bias to zero and see what happens? So we'll go uh, we'll go down here. So, sorry, uh, sorry, you're uh, not passing the class. Just kidding. <laughs> no, this there's label imbalance in this data set, which I didn't tell you about. Yeah, so th this was somewhat intentional um, here. Uh, there's label imbalance in the data set. Uh, positive is the most frequent class, followed closely by negative, and then neutral is the least frequent. The positive is. Um, <laughs> It is, it is more than, it's positive is less than 43%. Um, it's, uh, it's something like 40%. Yeah, do you, do you wanna, do you wanna check that? We can also check that by doing this. So uh, if we just, our chance rate, this is another, another very good concept to know. Your chance rate is how good you can do without making any predictions at all. And that would be, so adding good, adding good and, uh, and love helped uh, like a little bit, but not a huge problem. Any other ideas? There's a hidden, there's a hidden Easter egg here that you guys haven't uh, noticed yet. So this is, this is a plain, text string uh, exactly like I had, um, oops, uh, exactly like this. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> Okay, so what what if it um, what if instead of looking at the individual words, we didn't split it? Yeah, so let, let me let me first try to not uh, not split the words so I can do that by just doing for x in good words, um, if x in x, and then this. Oh, thank you. Shows me to do live coding in a class with uh, like 100 CMU students. And and without my uh, them binding. Okay. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll comment this out, and maybe this will be the last thing I'll do. You guys can uh, you can take this on uh, further if you want. And hopefully that will work and I didn't have any errors. Yeah, so that helped a little bit. That gave us like a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm revealing my I'm revealing my lack of use of Jupiter. I do uh, PyCharm and Vim most of the time. So yeah. Yeah, um, we're going to talk more about tokenization. Um, like one. 
Yeah, yeah. So another, um, there's a bunch of things. Like, I think one of the interesting things about this exercise is it points out all of these little things that you might not think about normally. But like one of the examples that Bob just pointed out is these, um, these are tokenized already. And what tokenization means is um, it's not entirely raw text. It, um, this has already had processing, like it's splitting off apostrophe S. It's uh, splitting off the quotes and stuff like this. And that actually makes the, um, like using the string directly less important because um, uh, like individual words are here, um, are, are split off already. Uh, there was also another example like n apostrophe p where don't is uh, split into do and n apostrophe p. So we should actually put um, n apostrophe p in here as well. Um, so yeah, uh, but basically you get the idea here. You can play around with this a little bit more. Um, one thing that people didn't notice that uh, I, I was thinking is kind of the easy low hanging fruit thing is um, I didn't lowercase the input string. And so this was not matching anything that was uppercase. So there's all kinds of like little things that we could have done to, uh, to make this better as well. Um, yeah. I would love to do this for the rest of the class, but you know, <laughs> I think you guys, uh, you guys would uh, rather hear about other things. Cool. Okay. Um, one important thing that we didn't really get into a lot is that the error analysis would be very useful here. You would be able to look at the places where it's failing, and come up with examples uh, that you can improve. Uh, or come up with like patterns that you could improve by improving the model in some way. This is going to be a big feature of the, a lot of the stuff that I talk about in this class, because I really think that in terms of effectively building better systems, effectively coming up with good research directions, understanding the weaknesses of current systems uh, is a very important part. Um, so yeah, uh, and we already went through this process, but uh, what's going wrong with the system, look at the error analysis, modify the model, measure accuracy improvements, except for reject changes. So we reject the change of changing the bias, for example, um, repeat from one. And then finally, when satisfied with trained dev accuracy, evaluate on test. So another thing I wanted to go through here, I'm not building a rule-based classifier so you can like go deploy this in production, obviously. I'm building a rule-based classifier because it teaches us some things. Yeah. Sure. How do you decide whether it's the model's fault or like the training algorithm's fault versus um, uh, like some other systematic error? This is a really good question. And I don't think there's any surefire way of figuring this out. Um, there are a few clues that you can get. So um, like, for example, um, I'm going to be talking about this later, but like, identifying whether your model is overfitting or not. Um, can't, there are ways around it, like adding more dropout, adding more regularization to your model or, or other things like this. If you've done all of these things and your model is still overfitting, um, then you know maybe you need to start reconsidering the model you're using. Um, another thing is recently there's a lot, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about these in more detail, but recently there are methods for systematic analysis of how well your model does on individual types of, you know, examples or errors or things like these. And um, you can even do this like comparatively with other models. And if your model is similar conceptually to something else that somebody's using, but it's far underperforming on a particular type of example or phenomenon or something like that then that could be a clue that there's something systematically wrong with your model in particular as opposed to other things. So, um, yeah, I, I think trying a lot of things out and building intuitions is one of the best ways to start understanding this. And hopefully that's what you can do during this class. Too. Cool. Um, so there are some difficult cases. I, I spent a lot of time uh, 
you know, on Monday, basically looking through some of the interesting cases. Um, so some interesting cases include low frequency words. So here's an example, um, the action switches between past and present, but the material link is too tenuous to anchor the emotional connections that purport to span a 125 year divide. Um, the, these are, this is from the dev set. Um, and this example from the dev set has words that were not included in the training set. However, these words actually, um, if you know the words tenuous and purport, they're negative sentiment words pretty clearly. Um, they're, you know, used mainly in negative scenarios. Um, so this would be negative, um, mucking in glitches, um, also negative. These are also not included in the training set. So just by using the training set, the model would not have been able to like latch on to these, uh, these associations. Um, one solution if you're building a rule-based system is, you know, keep working till you get all of them. Just continue doing error analysis over and over and over again until you get all of these. Maybe not the best solution or best way to spend your time. Um, there might also be other resources like uh, sentiment dictionaries or word embeddings or something like this that you could incorporate to solve this. Um, conjugation. Um, an operatic sprawling picture that's entertainingly acted magnificently shot. These both, these words both didn't appear in the training set. Uh, this is also a dev set example. However, the roots definitely did, right? So um, this is positive over long. Um, this is negative. Um, if you could analyze these words into their root forms and use that as features, then you could probably solve this. However, in order to do this, you need a morphological analyzer or lemmatizer or something like this. Um, this is even harder in non-English languages because English has very poor conjugation. When I say poor, I mean, it doesn't conjugate things very much. Other languages do a lot. Negation, this is the fun one. This one is not nearly as dreadful as expected. Positive, maybe, uh, weakly positive. Um, serving Sarah doesn't serve up a whole lot of laughs. Um, so negative, so there, there are no laughs. Here. Um, what is our solution? Maybe if a negation modifies a word, disregard it or flip it uh, in terms of its sentiment polarity. Um, in order to do that, you would probably need to do syn syntactic analysis of some type, unless you're using a, a machine learning model for the of doing it. Metaphor analogy, these were the fun ones to look up. Puts a human face on a land that most Westerners are unfamiliar with. So what does it mean to put a human face on something? Yeah, positive. Green might want to hang on to that ski mask as robbery may be the only way to pay for his next project. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty harsh. Has all the depth of a waiting pool. Yeah, negative. These ones are these ones are hard because you know, um, depth is maybe positive, right? Uh, kind of in general, um, but a waiting pool is not very deep. So, um, I have no idea how to solve these uh, well, actually. So, if we could solve them, that would be pretty awesome. But yeah. Um, I would say that uh, this movie has depth has lots of depth, that would be a pretty positive assessment. So that's another good point. So all of the things I'm saying here might be with regards to movies, whereas depth is pretty universally good. I can't think of very many things where depth would be bad, but to give a very standard example, um, there's a very nice paper, Bollywood boom Bollywood Boomboxes and Blenders on a multi-domain sentiment analysis. And uh, there they have an example, which is big um, or uh, big is a very positive word for an apartment, very negative word for a mobile, mobile phone, for example. Um, so uh, like definitely domain has something to do with it. The target of what you're talking about has something to do with it too. So that makes it even harder. Um, 
So yeah, what about this one? Any ideas? <laughs> Positive? Okay, pretty good. <laughs> what, what about what about this one? Nobody? Negative? Okay, pretty good. <laughs> so um, if you wanted to create a rule-based system, you'd probably have to learn Japanese to do this. Um, so uh, fortunately, it looks like we have some people in the class that are able to do that, but uh, you know, not so easy. Okay, so we have machine learning-based NLP methods. I'm sure people are familiar with this, uh, where we take a learning algorithm, learn a feature extractor, um, and a scoring function. Um, and then we have an inference algorithm, uh, maybe the same inference algorithm that we just applied here, and we apply this to uh, our dev and test sets. Um, <clears throat> one way we can do this is with a bag of words model. Um, and that's actually what we're going to be talking about next time, along with some other uh, experimental methodology related things. Um, but basically here, the feature extractor is set. The feature extractor, what it does is it extracts one feature for each word. Um, so in fact, I could write, um, I could write uh, a feature extractor like this, where basically it's like um, for x in x split, um, then features, x uh, plus equals one, you know, being, uh, th this won't actually work, but you, you get the idea. Um, so you extract a single feature for each of the, um, each of the words in the, uh, in the input. And we add them together and multiply them by some weights. And that gives us a score. Uh, take the dot product with some weights, that gives us a score. Um, and then uh, this allows us to um, this allows us to make predictions. So if we think about it, we solved a few problems uh, in designing a rule-based classifier. What problems would this solve? What problems would this bag of words model solve? Yeah. It'll help us look at a lot of words. So for example, it, um, it would allow us to pick up that not and no were good features for the negative label. Yeah. Yeah, it'll help in assigning the weights. So we had like a weight of one for every good word and a weight of negative one for every bad word. This gives us a much more nuanced thing, um, much more nuanced view. What problems would this not solve? Doesn't talk about the combination of features. It also doesn't lowercase our sentence for us, for example. So if we forgot to do that beforehand, um, we would have to fix that. It also doesn't tokenize the words. It doesn't lemmatize the words. It doesn't solve a whole bunch of other problems like this. So um, it definitely gets us some of the way there, um, but you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't solve all of our problems for us. Um, so a better attempt, which is also what we're going to talk about for the great majority of the class, is methods based on um, neural network models. And the, um, oh, I got another uh, thing, unknown words, word forms on Zoom. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point as well. Um, and so here in neural network models, basically what we do is we look up a vector expressing each word and feed it into some complicated function to extract features, uh, get the features, take the dot product with the weights and get our score and make our determination. So instead, um, we're learning the weights, we're learning the feature, um, we're learning the weights, but in contrast to the bag of words model, now we also learn the feature extractor. We also learn the thing that um, extracts the salient features, the features that are useful for making our predictions. Um, so going back to this again, um, I, I forgot to mention this while we were doing the rule-based classifier, but one important thing here is, remember what I said before, the feature extractor is removing information. It's removing inform all the information about um, the things that we think are not important for making the classification decision. 
So in this rather extreme case, it removed information about all of the words except the words that we had listed here. It also removed information about what order the words were in, for example, um, because we didn't think that was immediately useful for what we were doing. Maybe that's not a right choice, but um, it, removed, uh, it removed information. So that's the basic idea of uh, feature extraction. And the idea is that neural networks give us a way to do this better than most of the other ways we can do this. And they also can be learned from data uh, in a way that makes it very conducive to doing this. Um, so the class goals, I kind of outlined these already, learn in detail about building NLP systems from a research perspective, um, learn basic and advanced topics in machine learning and neural network approaches to natural language processing, um, learn linguistic knowledge useful in NLP and learn methods to analyze linguistic structure. We're not gonna go into uh, tons of depth in linguistics. We have other great courses like human language for AI if you want to do that, um, but we will uh, try to cover the basics. Um, see several case studies of NLP applications. So NLP is now applied in so many different places that there's no way I could talk about every NLP application, but I want to talk about some that I feel are representative of the interesting and difficult problems that we face when building NLP applications so that you can then extrapolate and say, you know, I want to do this thing. You know, these are kind of the, the things that I should be following. Um, also, very importantly, learn how to debug when and where NLP systems fail and build improvements based on this. So uh, understanding when things are not going wrong, why they are, uh, when things are not going right, why they are going wrong. Um, and then very quickly, I'd like to go through the roadmap of what, the, what we're going to be covering. So um, this class is split into six topics. Um, the first one is machine learning and neural net fundamentals. Um, so that includes today's uh, kind of overview, uh, text classification and machine learning fundamentals, including statistical significance testing, various other things like this, uh, data creation, um, neural network basics and toolkit construction. So we're going to look at the, what a neural network toolkit looks like. And the first assignment, uh, we're actually going to try to um, not from scratch, but build one ourselves. Um, then language modeling and neural network training tricks. So talking about uh, the task of language modeling. Um, we'll have sequence models, uh, including recurrent networks, sequence labeling, uh, condition generation, and detention and transformers. Topic four, we're going to talk about representation and pre-training. So this includes uh, transfer learning, multitask learning, uh, pre-training methods, which are kind of essential to NLP nowadays. Um, sequence to sequence pre-training and prompting. So these are kind of new uh, topics uh, that have been very important recently. Um, interpreting and debugging NLP models. So this will include interpreting the inside and out, um, outside of NLP models. Um, natural language analysis, including word segmentation and morphology tokenization. Um, syntactic parsing, semantic parsing, and discourse structure and analysis. Um, NLP applications, including machine reading, QA, where you basically answer questions based on text, dialogue, um, computational social science, including topics in bi bias and fairness, and uh, information extraction and knowledge-based QA. So um, the, in contrast to machine reading QA, this is where you create a database of information uh, with respect to which you'll be answering questions and then use it to answer questions. And then finally, advanced learning techniques like uh, long sequence models. How can we process whole documents with a neural network? Uh, structured learning algorithms, latent variable models, and adversarial methods. Um, and then with respect to the class format and structure, um, we're trying a new thing. Um, so any feedback you have on the class format is also very, very welcome. Uh, this is the first time we've done anything like this. So I, uh, I'd love to hear comments is like sooner rather than later if something's not working for you. Um, but uh, the class is, at the moment is split into Tuesday and Thursday groups. Um, on your day, you're encouraged to come in person. Um, 
On the other day, you're encouraged to join synchronously via Zoom if possible, and the class will be recorded for review in case you uh, want to go back and look at it later. Um, the class content, uh, before classes, for some classes, we'll have a recommended reading um, that I ask people to uh, do beforehand. Usually these will not be too long, but they'll give you some background um, uh, to, to think about before you come. Then during class, we'll have the lecture discussion, go through material and discuss. Um, we might have a code or data walk. This will probably be shorter than the one we did today, but um, give you a chance to look at the code a little bit. And then um, you can go back and uh, ask questions in office hours or, or other uh, times. Um, after class, uh, do a, a quiz about the class or the reading material. There's no quiz this time, but uh, starting next time we might, uh, we. We'll have them many classes. Shouldn't be hard if you pay attention to the class and do uh, whatever you do. Oops, my PDF is, okay. So assignments, um, in the, the quizzes will be some portion of the grade. It's written on the website. I think it's like 10 or 15%. Um, the rest will be from assignments. There's no final exam. Um, the first assignment is an individual assignment. Uh, where you build your own neural network toolkit. You're not going to build it from scratch, but you're going to implement some parts of it. And the goal of this is to understand the inner workings of a neural network toolkit, specifically one that is designed for like natural language processing. So we have a neural network toolkit called MIN, M-I-N-N-N, -N -N, uh, Minimalist Neural Network Toolkit. And um, you'll be implementing parts of that. Um, a second one is uh, individually implementing a text classifier using BERT. Um, and so you will have to implement kind of the in, inside of BERT, you know, a, uh, a popular model for uh, like NLP in general. Um, and there will also be a questionnaire of topics on interest. And this will be used to help you form groups if you haven't formed one already by this point. The next one um, will be a state-of-the-art survey and re-implementation of a uh, state-of-the-art uh, research work. Um, basically, uh, by then, this will be a group assignment. So you'll work with two or a group of two or three people. And um, you will re-implement and reproduce results from a recently published NLP paper. Sorry, when I say re-implement, I mean reproduce. So um, you can use the code that people are using. This is actually a change that we made last year or last class. Um, before you had to actually re-implement from scratch, basically using only PyTorch or a neural network toolkit. Now it's too hard to do that for state-of-the-art models. So you basically have to download and run their code and make sure that you can get it to run. So um, then the final project, um, you'll perform a unique project that either improves on whatever state-of-the-art model you re-implemented or applies NLP models to a unique task. Um, you will be required to present a poster and write a report. The poster, you need to present it, but it's not specifically graded for quality. So just, you know, <laughs> The only penalty for poor quality is being very embarrassed when you're uh, <laughs> when you're PRC. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it, please do a good job of it because it's a good way to uh, to like discuss with your peers. In, in a different context, we did one time give someone a plus for something that was not actually a plus. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it, it needs to be. Well, let me say there's a threshold, but you know, just uh, just exceed the threshold. And I think we'll ideally have a poster presentation here or something like this. So um, you can go around in the class and hear what other people are doing, give comments and stuff. And um, then uh, there will be a poster and uh, a report. The report will be the main graded part. 